Good evening, and thank you. It's, uh, it is a, indeed a joy to be here. Uh, I want to thank Carl and Leighton and those of you on the planning committee who helped put this together. I think we started uh, about a year and a half ago getting this on the schedule, and now it, the day has arrived, and I'm just delighted uh, to be with this group of people this evening. Um, I look forward to visiting uh, Providence Seminary. I've not been there before, but I have been on this campus before, and it's a, just a rich setting to be in. Um, I told, I think, Wally Croker a few minutes ago that CMU stands for me as a, a minor miracle in Mennonite ecumenicity. It's, uh, it's just a reason to be hopeful that uh, institutions could find their way together and seemingly so successfully. So uh, it's great to be here and uh, I'm honored by your presence. I think many of the things that I have to say this evening will not necessarily be new to many of you. I look out here and I see uh, people who have lived their entire lives in the context of the global church. So I don't pretend to be uh, instructing you on anything new, but I do want to uh, maybe put the pieces together in a way that, um, that makes at least momentary sense to me and then invite your reaction. So part of the gift of your presence here to me is in the comments, the corrections, the questions uh, that will follow uh, our presentation. On the night of uh, March 21, 1526, a group of Anabaptists broke through the iron bars in a window uh, of the New Tower, which was a prison built in the moat surrounding the city of Zurich, and they escaped by lowering themselves to the water below. Two weeks earlier, the city council of Zurich had sentenced uh, the 19 prisoners, uh, among them five women, to life imprisonment for, quote, disobedience, the injury of public order and authority, and the subversion of the common good and true Christian conduct. According to the testimony of Wilhelm Exel, who was captured almost immediately after the prison break, the group was undecided about where to go once they had made their way outside the city walls. One said he would go here, and another there, reported Exel. But others joked among themselves and said they would go to the Red Indians across the sea. In point of fact, we do know where many of the escapees went. Conrad Grable, for example, moved to Mayenfeld, where he died of an illness in August of 1526. Felix Mantz went to Embach, was soon thereafter uh, uh, captured and then executed in the city of Zurich in January of 1527. George Blaurock, uh, embarked on a remarkable uh, three-year uh, missionary career in the Tyrol before he too was captured and burned at the stake in September 1529. Apparently, no one in the group made it to the Indians across the sea, but that reference said no doubt in jest pointed to a future Excel could only imagine. It would be another century and a half before the first Anabaptists came to North America where they encountered native peoples, as we heard about already in the introduction, and another two centuries after that before they recovered the urgency of the Great Commission to move beyond Europe and North America to bring the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. But in many ways, the missionary zeal uh, uh, the global vision suggested by Wilhelm Exel's thoughts of migrating to the new world pointed toward a truly profound development that has unfolded in the past 50 years in the form of the explosive growth of the Anabaptist movement all around the world so that the movement of religious revival and reform that began to unfold in Zurich in the years after 1525 has today given rise to a global fellowship of some 227 conferences in 80 countries around the world, numbering around 2.2 million members. 
When I first started teaching at Goshen in 1985, there were perhaps 600,000 Anabaptists in the world, the great majority of them uh, living in Europe and North America. During the past 40 years, the tradition that I had devoted my life to studying was quietly undergoing a profound revolution. So that, as I just said, there's something like 2.2 million Anabaptist Mennonites in the world, and the overwhelming majority of them live outside of Europe and North America. Here you can see the comparative growth uh, the blue color is 1978, the green 2015. And it always seems important to me to point out that even though it looks as if there has been enormous growth in North America, there has indeed been growth, but almost all of that growth can be accounted for by the Old Order Amish. So it is collective growth in the Anabaptist tradition, but not of the sort that we are accustomed to thinking of. I did the calculations recently and the groups that I identify most closely with, that would be MC USA and MC Canada combined, today count for less than 6% of the global Anabaptist family, which is not at all how I or we perceive ourselves. We think of ourselves much more as at the center and of the rest of the church somehow on the periphery around us. I don't know how your groups imagine that relationship, but that's a kind of default mode for us, and I say that as a confession. Since the year 2000, 93% of all of the growth in the global church has been in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So only 7% of the growth in Europe and North America. Here you see the figures rearranged slightly differently as a percentage of the total. And here you have a kind of overview of 2.2 million Anabaptists in the world. Of them, about 1.5 or 1.7 uh, million are parts of groups, members of groups who affiliate with Mennonite World Conference, which is the window that is most proximate to me for understanding the global church. 10,000 congregations, maybe 107 groups, uh, and in uh, 58 uh, countries, 60-some uh, languages. From the perspective of a 500-year-old tradition, this is an astounding development. There are times when I wake up and I thank God that God saw fit in my lifetime, in our lifetime, to witness this demographic explosion in our little corner of God's kingdom. And it seems to me, as someone who cares deeply about this story, um, that we are attentive to what is happening in uh, the church outside of uh, our closest uh, awareness. This evening, I want to trace three basic steps in my reflections. How did this happen? What are the sources of this really remarkable uh, demographic revolution? Uh, second, what does it mean to be part of a global church? Uh, how are we to picture ourselves as part of this story? Is there still a place for us in this story? What, is it, what, what does that look like? And if we have time, uh, I'd like to conclude with some theological reflections based on one of the favorite verses of the Anabaptists, the first verse of Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. Uh, we'll see how I budget my time. So how did this come to be? Again, this probably will not uh, be uh, uh, surprising or, or, or news to you. But one significant source of the globalization of our Anabaptist fellowship is what I call the diaspora of German-speaking, or you could say ethnic, uh, Mennonites. And that story in some ways began right here in Manitoba when the oppressive provincial governments of Manitoba and Saskatchewan uh, re repealed some of the uh, 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 understandings uh, 
uh, with uh, immigrant groups, Mennonite groups, uh, particularly in regards to the use of German in uh, public school or in their schools, and in an interest in preserving the cultural uh, and religious identity of their group. Uh, in the 1920s, I think it was a group of Rhinelanders who first moved to Mexico, and then subsequently other old colonies, the Sommerfelder, the Quartitzers, uh, Blumenthal, moved then to Paraguay. And after that, another movement of German-speaking Mennonites who fled Soviet Russia under the Bolshevik Revolution, looking for a safe haven, some of them through dramatic roundabout routes through China, ended up, of course, in Paraguay, soon thereafter in Brazil. And then in the subsequent decades in the 20th century, there is a story of ongoing migration. In the 1940s, another wave coming out of the Soviet Union, uh, also mostly to South America, though some uh, also to Canada. Uh, and then within each of those groups, a complex series of further migration. So from, from Guatemoc in Mexico into southern Mexico, into Belize, from Belize to Bolivia, Bolivia, and now uh, in places like Chile and Peru, uh, Argentina, the hunger for land goes on. And in, you know these stories better than I do, in many of these settings, these groups have successfully preserved a very distinct identity, even in their globalized location. Some of them have adopted the languages of their native countries. Some of them have, have uh, developed a zeal for mission and have reached out uh, and connected. In the 1960s, a much smaller group of beachy Amish and even old order Amish uh, also made the trek so that in, in Paraguay, uh, there are groups, small groups, Lucien Esperanza of Beachy Amish and uh, I think three families still of Old Order Amish. Um, so this is one face of the globalization of the Anabaptist Fellowship that should be noted right from the start, even though in the United States, I would say, Mennonites in my part of the country have very little awareness. If they do, it's usually associated with the worst kind of stories that are reported then in the popular media about some kind of, uh, of, of abuse or some bizarre thing that has happened. But they, I would say there's not a very full sense of, of the big picture of old colony identity. Uh, a second um, significant uh, source of, whoops, of globalization uh, came in the form of the missionary movement. Uh, as in many things, uh, Mennonites were somewhat late uh, in the Protestant mission movement. Uh, the first mission outreaches were in the 1850s uh, with initiatives from Dutch Mennonites in the Netherlands, soon to find support from South Russia with a focus on Indonesia. And so uh, groups that emerged in Indonesia from the 1850s onward remain as vibrant communities, the outgrowth of that missionary movement. Uh, in the first half, uh, let's see, there were seven more missionary uh, initiatives before the 1900s. In the first half of the 20th century, 18 missionary initiatives now to central, uh, to in India, uh, South America. The 1950s, we see an explosion, 52 uh, Mennonite uh, mission plants uh, in the decade of the 50s. And since then, another 75 uh, identified Mennonite missions from North America and Europe to the uttermost ends of the earth and generally following a fairly classic model of going with schools, with clinics, um, often starting very small, and uh, teaching the good news of the gospel, usually but not always in a fairly generic Protestant language, uh, a language that was communicable in a missionary context. Uh, a third expression of the globalization of the Anabaptist church 
one that maybe goes under the radar, but I at least want to mention it, is the more recent emergence of what might be called Anabaptist networks. These consist largely of individuals who find themselves uneasy in the denominations of their uh, main identity. Sometimes by reading the gospel, sometimes reading other literature, they're hungry for uh, maybe a, a stronger sense of community, a deeper understanding of discipleship, an interest in reconciliation and peacemaking, and they encounter Anabaptist Mennonite ideas, and they have found each other. And they develop informal networks, sometimes formal networks, with newsletters and uh, but often informal networks, and many of these groups in various places around the world don't formally leave their own denominations, but they identify themselves in one way or another with Anabaptism through these networks. This is relatively small. Actually, it's very small. But I, I think it still bears noting that there are places in the world of people who are, have an affinity with the ideas, the theological uh, uh, ideas of Anabaptism, uh, and find each other uh, even if they're not establishing uh, churches. By far, the most significant engine for the globalization, the dramatic growth of our worldwide fellowship, has come about through what I would call the indigenization of the missionary message. That is, in virtually every place where Mennonite missionaries landed, at a certain point, recipients of the good news of the gospel said something like, thank you very much, we'll take it from here. And at that point, began to, not always easily, I mean the transition from the mission movement to indigenous or to local control over churches is worth more attention. It's a complicated story. But in many places where that has happened successfully and local leaders have given voice to the gospel in the music and the cultural inflections and the idioms and the, um, the, the, the theological worldview out of which they have, in which they are embedded, we have seen rapid growth in these churches. One of the classic examples for me is the story of the Mezarete Christos Church in Ethiopia. It started in the 1940s in a kind of classic way, Mennonite missionaries, in this case from Lancaster, from Eastern Mennonite missions, started clinics, they started schools, a school for the blind, dressing schools, schools that trained uh, nurses, uh, and they did it in the very restricted areas, and they had modest success. In the 1950s, an offshoot of the East African revival a group called a Heavenly Sunshine made its way through the mission compound the, in Nazareth and other places in Ethiopia where the missionaries were working. And the missionaries at least had the good sense to allow these young people who were inspired by a more charismatic understanding of the gospel to give them space and, and, and kind of protected them as they um, uh, entered into periods of intense confession, of prayer, of singing. It was a young people's movement. And then in 1974, uh, social regime change in Ethiopia, a Marxist government came in, a repressive government. The church was forced uh, underground in 1982, was officially um, uh, uh, closed. The six leaders whom the uh, had assumed leadership, Ethiopian leaders who had assumed leadership of the MK church. Uh, uh, the missionaries were forced to leave. The six leaders who were left were all imprisoned. And the church was forced underground. And in that experience of persecution and repression, the church developed an amazing array of strategies, not just for survival, but for thriving. They developed a system of cell groups. Women emerged as primary leaders in these cell groups. 
uh, invited neighbors in for tea over which they would have Bible study. Lay leaders emerged who developed curriculum for discipleship training, printed it out on little printing presses, had their own Samus dot, you know, their own underground press for distributing this curriculum. A highly developed organization, some of them made a trip to the Soviet Union to meet with Mennonites to talk about how they had survived in periods of repression, brought back that wisdom from the global church. And when that regime came to an end in 1994, a little group of 5,000 people suddenly emerged as a church of 50,000 people and the growth of the MKC church has continued virtually uninterrupted ever since. So that today, uh, there are something like 375,000 baptized members of the MKC church with hundreds of smaller groups that are not quite official status of church. And so um, on any given Sunday, well, uh, estimates are 500,000 worshiping in MKC-related churches uh, across uh, Ethiopia. The central themes of the Ethiopian story have since been repeated among other Anabaptist groups as well. As local leaders emerged in positions of leadership and as the church has faced persecution, it has witnessed enormous growth. Um, and uh, so, okay, the Ethiopian church, which is today the largest, in 2002, it became the largest national uh, conference uh, in our global fellowship. Uh, yeah, large churches, uh, three or at least two and a half uh, churches in the Democratic Republic uh, of Congo uh, that have also survived in the face of just remarkable uh, uh, difficulty that is uh, uh, ongoing, of course. In Zimbabwe, a situation of immense economic hardship, also repression, the Brethren in Christ Church has thrived and is a dynamic uh, member of, of Mennonite World Conference. Um, in uh, India, I think eight different groups that have associated each with their own kind of mission story. Uh, uh, and uh, each of them continue to focus uh, on growth. In Indonesia, fascinating story of three different groups in Indonesia. The GITJ church that traces its history back to the uh, missionaries from Indonesia, but with a profound indigenization that started in the first generation when a mystic named Tulung Wulung uh, baptized by Mennonites, but he never really, really took to their mentorship. And he had a vision of Christian communities that he carved out of the jungle uh, that were sort of alternative ways of living to the Dutch colonial rule of his time and was willing to blend a kind of Javanese mysticism uh, into the liturgical practices that were brought to them by somewhat more sober-minded Dutch uh, rational uh, uh, Mennonite missionaries, uh, who, by the way, left an enormous legacy in the form of a, of a Javanese dictionary, the translation of scripture. So I, I don't di diminish the importance of missionaries. Uh, and then a Chinese group of immigrants that came to Indonesia. I could, I shouldn't get, get sorry. It, it is a fascinating story. Most recently, the JKI Church is a story of a charismatic renewal movement coming largely out of the JKMI, the, the Chinese ethnic group uh, that has exploded in growth so that the Holy Stadium in Samarang, uh, it, a, a massive church in the heart of a largely Muslim uh, city. Uh, and the, that story of com combining charismatic worship with a vibrant social outreach and uh, um, s social service organization is, is just uh, remarkable. This development that we see uh, in these various countries and indeed in many others 
is part of a much larger transformation of the global Christian church as the demographic center of Christianity has shifted decisively away from Europe and North America to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Now, Mennonites in North America are not blind to these realities. Um, we, our churches are filled with people who have spent significant years in international service. Many of our churches, I'm sure in Winnipeg, have immigrants as part of your congregations. The world comes to us even as social media brings us closer to the world. We, um, I hope you receive the courier from Mennonite World Conference. I hope that you are aware, and by the way, Gerald Hildebrand, where are you, Gerald, is, uh, is uh, with us as the regional representative of Mennonite World Conference, and he would be glad to give you information if you don't have it already. I think we are, we have an awareness of the global church, but at the same time, uh, maybe I'm speaking mostly for myself, but there's a kind of uncertainty about what this transformation means. I think for most of us, the inclination is to think in, um, in tribal terms. Clearly, these new congregations have no cultural or ethnic or genealogical ties to the Swiss, German, Dutch, Prussian, Russian Mennonites that tend to dominate the institutions of the churches in North America. And why we ask ourselves, though probably not in public, why would a church in Benin want to cast their lot with us? Or we're inclined to raise questions about doctrine and practice. When a new church emerges in Ghana that calls itself Mennonite, what exactly do they mean by that term? What if they preach a gospel of health and wealth? What if their leadership is dominated by a single patriarch and the church council by members of his family? What if they focus on more powerful expressions of the spirit's presence in worship and show little visible interest in pacifism or the gospel of peace? Lurking somewhere behind these questions are deeper concerns about branding and identity a desire to preserve the good name of the franchise, and maybe even a little bit of uneasiness about our own qualifications as heirs of the Anabaptist tradition. Part of our uneasiness has to do with our ecclesiology, how we understand the church. Compared with many other denominations, uh, Mennonites are a small group. Our 2.2 million, you know, I present that as if that's such a big number. In the scheme of the global church, 2.2 million is really a tiny, tiny fraction. And yet, despite that small size, we still have a hard time thinking beyond our congregation or our conference-oriented polity. Um, one way of framing it is, where does the authority to define the church reside? Who has the right to say we are a church? Um, the roughly 1.2 billion Catholics, so we have 2.2 billion Christians in the world, 2.4 billion, half of them are Catholic. So 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, many different countries, of course, uh, would recognize, at least in theory, their unity in the teaching office of the church and the spiritual authority of Pope Benedict, the, or of Pope Francis I. I mean, they would disagree with the Pope on all kinds of things. It's not to say that Catholics are in, in complete unanimity, but there is no question, ultimately, if you are a, if you are a, a faithful Catholic, of where authority resides on matters of faith and doctrine. It resides in the magisterium, and it resides ultimately in the person uh, of the pope. There are something like 68 million Lutherans in the world who also live in 
enormously different cultural contexts who disagree with each other on a lot of things. But 68 million Lutherans in the world, at least in the form of the Lutheran World Federation, are unified by an agreement that the Augsburg Confession, a confession that goes back to 1530, is the authoritative lens through which they are going to read scripture, even if they might disagree about the outcome. When a Lutheran priest or pastor, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, when a Lutheran pastor is ordained, that pastor takes an oath at ordination that they will uphold the unaltered Augsburg Confession, which gives it at least a symbolic kind of glue to the worldwide Lutheran Church. If you're a member of the 80 million uh, Anglicans in the world, you know that your bishop who baptized you when you were a baby was ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who can be traced in an apostolic succession all the way back to Peter who got his authority from Christ. And all of these groups have a high view of the sacraments, which means that on Sunday morning, no matter what your personal or doctrinal or ethical disagreement might be with your neighbor next to you, when you come forward and when you receive the body of Christ that is broken for you, you are entering into a spiritual communion that binds you together with brothers and sisters around the world. Now, there are problems with all of these forms of authority, of ecclesial identity, but as I said this afternoon, there are some mornings when I wake up and wish that we had a pope. I wish that we had some final voice of authority. I don't really. I mean, there are, I think the moment we had a pope, we would find many good reasons as we did in the 16th century for saying this is a bad idea for churches. But there is something um, comforting about that sense of at least symbolic ecclesial uh, unity. Um, what do Mennonites have? Well, Mennonites throughout the centuries have generally valued the particular concrete face-to-face -face relationships of our local communities over hierarchical forms of authority or doctrinal formulations. Uh, so how do we think about that in a global sense? One approach may be reflexive for understanding our relationship to the global Anabaptist church is historical or genealogical. This is, this is my first impulse as a historian. So if a new group emerges in Kenya or Indonesia who asks what does it mean to be a Mennonite, the answer proceeds genealogically in which I can trace a lineage back to the Mennonite missionary who brought you the good news of the gospel. And from the missionary, I get you back to Canada or North America. And from North America, I can get the story back to Europe to the beginnings of the Anabaptist movement in Zurich in 1525. So one impulse is to say, you belong because you are part of this narrative. And to get to the narrative, though, you have to understand the intermediary steps. And ultimately, you actually need to understand the theological worldview and the debates that unfolded in the 16th century that gave rise to the Anabaptist movement if you are going to understand what it means for you to be a Mennonite now in your setting. Or, Maybe we're inclined to describe our connection in theological language in which all those who identify themselves as part of uh, this group formally agree to some set of foundational Anabaptist convictions. In this model, it ends up usually being uh, some North American church or group or individuals that would serve as the accrediting agency. You know, we would show up, if church says we want to be Mennonite, somebody will show up and 
have a list of criteria that you need to either believe or exemplify that matches some standard, a uh, theological standard, and then you can be christened as part of the family or part of the group. I think both history and theology matter. So don't hear my critique of this as a dismissal of the importance of narrative or the importance of theology. But if we follow through on the theological question, uh, where, who, where does that standard come from? And who of I mean, if in Holmes County, Ohio, where I grew up, there are 29 different groups of Anabaptists and Mennonites, and I think 27 of them don't commune with each other. Um, which of those groups is going to show up and tell a church in Burkina Faso that you meet the appropriate criteria to be called uh, an Anabaptist or a Mennonite? On what basis do we define theological criteria when we have such profound difficulties in our own circles for agreeing on whether you are worthy to be in my circle or not? Um, I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a minor question or a small challenge for us. Um, both models, I think, suggest the possi a kind of relationship that in the end we may not want to affirm. Um, no image for describing ecclesial relationships is perfect. The Apostle Paul, of course, uses the metaphor of the body, which points to the mutual importance and interdependence of each part. And it's presumptuous of me to try to improve on the Apostle Paul, but I'm going to be presumptuous nonetheless. I'm going to offer you my image, my, another metaphor. But keep in mind, metaphors are just mental pictures. They're, this is not, uh, this is not uh, doctrine. I would like to suggest that an alternative image, one that might preserve certain elements of an Anabaptist Mennonite ecclesiology, comes to us from biology. I don't know if there are gardeners here, but I'd like to suggest a biological metaphor, and that's the metaphor of a rhizome. Rhizomes, as you might know, are plants that propagate by sending out lateral roots just beneath the soil. And at certain points, a taproot goes down. And at places that you can never fully predict, a sprout will shoot up above the, the soil and um, suddenly appear. And you can't fully control. I mean, that's part of the nature of rhizomes. You can't control the growth of a rhizome. But the beauty of a rhizome is that even though it appears as if it is many individual plants above the ground, in reality, beneath the soil, this is all one living organism that is connected together in an intricate web of micro-connections through the root system. Not just one connection of one root to another, but many, many little points of connection. Um, I borrow this quote from Jacques Deleuze, a rhizome has no beginning or end. It's always in the middle between things. Rhizomes are always in relationship of mutual connectivity and in alliances with multiple entry and exit points. In fact, that model over there, I love the image, but it's too tidy. It's too, um, it's too uniform to actually capture a rhizome. Tiger lilies are rhizomes. Bamboo is rhizomes. And as some people have pointed out, poison ivy is a rhizome. Quack grass is, a, you know, the stuff that you try to get out of your. And I'm not entirely deterred by that. The church is like quack grass. The church should be the kind of thing that sprouts up and you try to get rid of it. You try to push it down. You try to push it back. And it just keeps coming. Uh, one of my favorite um, extensions of this metaphor, but remember, it's just a metaphor, uh, is the Pondo Aspen Grove in Utah. Aspen's trees, you might know, are a rhizome. So here we have uh, uh, 150 acres of aspen trees, some 50,000 trees that are 
look from the exterior as if they are individual trees, but it is one living organism. And scientists have discovered if you do damage to the aspen grove at one end, it can be detected chemically by trees at the, at the far end so that the body truly does bear the, the suffering or sense the suffering of the other. And one last image that I will leave you with and then we'll move on is the hosta. And the reason I love the hosta, I think hostas grow in Winnipeg, don't they? They grow in many climates. And here's what I love about the hosta. <laughs> the hosta has the unique biological trick that it can spontaneously mutate and develop what's called a sport so that what is beneath the soil, one organism, manifests itself above the soil in different leaf patterns, despite the fact that it's part of the same organism. That's the problem with the, with the biological metaphor. Everything looks the same, you know, bamboo uh, is all bamboo. Well, a hosta is still a hosta, but the beauty of it is that it can appear differently. It doesn't demand sameness in its visible expression. Um, Mennonite World Conference is quite intentionally a rhizomic organization. Uh, in contrast to many of its parallel organizations in the Christian world, and these are good organizations, but I think of the Seventh-day Adventists who have their headquarters in a gleaming building in Silver Springs, Maryland, or the Lutheran World Federation, which like other World Council of Churches is in Geneva, Switzerland, a beautiful city, the most expensive city in the world. There they are. Um, the um, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has a lovely building in the heart of downtown Chicago. The World Communion of Reformed Churches, big building in Hanover, uh, Germany. Uh, the headquarters of Mennonite World Conference until just a few weeks ago was in a little building at the edge of Bogota, the second story of a really nondescript building with, with a roof that leaks and a few offices and I think an FTE a staff for 1.5 million member organization of maybe 9.5 or something like that. MWC, Mennonite World Conference, does not aspire to be a headquarters of the global Anabaptist church. Instead, it is committed through its various organizations and programs to rhizome growth. How can we help the body of Christ enrich this multipli multiplicity of small connections, connections that often go unnoticed, maybe even people unaware of them, and yet nevertheless are part of a living organism. Uh, a few words about um, the history of Mennonite World Conference. Um, and I'll go through this very quickly, but it seems to me when we ask where has the global fellowship come from, it would be important to note the steps sort of in the emergence of Mennonite World Conference. Um, the first gathering, a small group in 1925 uh, in Switzerland, um, in which in the course of their conversation, it's a little misleading maybe in the, t in, the, in the quote there, but in the course of their conversation, they became keenly aware. They met for theological conversation and, and for fraternal connections. Almost all of them European churches, there was one uh, representative, Jakob Krebel from, from the United States. But in the course of their conversations, they became keenly aware that there were uh, brothers and sisters in South Russia who were suffering. And even though they were quite skeptical about, they would, would not have communion. In fact, that was absolutely clear right up until 1948 that they would not have communion with each other, that this was not about ecumenicity. They were going to keep their distinct identity, but they could come together in relief work for uh, suffering brothers and sisters. And so in the course of the following gatherings, 
1930 in Danzig, 1936 in Amsterdam, the Mennonite World Aid Conference, the General Congress of Mennonites, 1939, a big disruption. So in the heart of what was then the Anabaptist Mennonite Fellowship in Europe, a war breaks out that includes combatants in Germany and some parts of the Soviet Union in active battle against combatants in France and some in the Netherlands. Um, and those wounds, those wounds went very, very deep. Uh, it is a painful part of our global family's history. It simply has to be acknowledged. But it also is worth saying that in the aftermath of World War II, uh, when the question was, can we go forward as a global fellowship? It was finally agreed that the next gathering would be in North America. And here we had a new kind of war that broke out between the old Mennonites in Goshen and the General Conference in Newton about who would host it. And they finally agreed that they would co-host it. So it started out in Goshen and then it moved to Newton. And the organizers of the conference had the good sense to insist that the leaders from Europe who were coming would be on the same boat and would be berthed next to each other so that German leaders and French leaders and Dutch leaders spent two weeks bumping into each other on that long ocean voyage. And when they came to North America, there was a clear public statement uh, of confession, an apology. It's not to say that the wounds of war are simply healed with a public statement, but it was a framework in which brothers and sisters who had been in deadly combat with each other were able to find a space to move towards uh, unity. In the years since then, ongoing assemblies, usually every six years, I won't go into the details, but each had a kind of identity uh, of its own. Um, and sorry if I'm going too fast here, but uh, uh, up until 1990, all of the global assemblies had either been in Europe or in uh, North America, 1990 in Winnipeg. And then another step, I think a really crucial step in the development of World Conference, what you might call the indigenization of Mennonite World Conference, because along the way at each of these global assemblies, there were a growing number of delegates coming from the global church, and the space on the program was increasingly given. You know, early, early the program is clearly teaching of North Americans and Europeans to whoever shows up. Increasingly, people from India, people from Indonesia are given space to share and to teach their understandings of various uh, Mennonite doctrines at these gatherings. But then in Calcutta, Bulawayo, Asuncion in 2009, and a, I think a hugely symbolic, uh, not just symbolic, a real uh, shift when uh, Cesar Garcia, uh, a Mennonite brother from Bogota, uh, became the uh, uh, general secretary of Mennonite church and the offices moved to Bogota. Uh, and uh, 20, uh, 2015 then in, in Pennsylvania. Some of you, I'm sure many of you have been part of global assemblies in one form or another. Um, so what does it mean to be a conference? And right now there are active conversations whether that's the right word for about 12 years, we have had a subtitle, Mennonite World Conference, a communion of Anabaptist Mennonite related <coughs> groups. I think that's right. Churches, thank you. Churches, not groups, churches. Um, a communion. Should we move from a conference to a communion? And what would be implied by that. Um, clearly, the network of relationships that Mennonite World Conference has nurtured has thickened through the years. It's much more than just a family gathering every six years. Um, so there was a 
20-year process leading up to an agreement on a shared conviction. So the seven shared convictions, not a confession of faith, but it was a long, arduous, careful process in which many, many voices were heard. The document was sent back, returned, and the seven shared convictions has served Mennonite World Conference actually uh, quite well. Um, books like Sharing Gifts in the Global Family of Faith. If you haven't seen this book, it's, you're, you, you, should, you should find it. <laughs> Tim Lind and Pakisa Shamika develop here a beautiful vision for what it means to be part of Mennonite World Conference. And at the heart of that is that every single group has a gift to share. And the question is, how are you going to share the gift that you have? And for some of it, some of us, how are we going to receive gifts that are given if you have a pretty clear picture of yourself as a gift giver rather than a gift receiver? But the basic premise is you wouldn't be part of this family if you didn't come with a gift to share. And the burden, the, the responsibility on each of us is to be hungry for your gift, to seek it out, to invite it, to assume that we have a deficit until we have received that gift. The Anabaptist Bookshelf, an effort to promote global conversations on a single theme, hasn't always gone well, but we've had a number of books that we've tried to translate in many different languages to try to have a shared conversation. The Global Mennonite History Project, also a 20-year project, five volumes, and the genius of that project is that it's not a missionary history. It, the missionaries matter in this, but it's a history written by in local historians, local leaders, telling their story in their context and giving voice to that story. Uh, again, if, you haven't, if you're not aware of those five volumes, I hope, I'm sure the CMU Library has them, translated into French and Spanish as well. Uh, mission networks, servant, we have in many of our global churches, you know, missions don't, are, are not just the preserve of North Americans and Europeans, of course. Every local church has a mission. And the question for Mennonite World Conference is not how can we develop yet another mission agency, but can we be a space where these many different mission organizations can come together and can talk about what does it mean to be a missionary in your context? How are, what, what are the challenges you're facing? What can we agree on in terms of mission strategies? Uh, the same is true with service networks. Uh, MCC has done amazing things, continue to do amazing things around the world. It is largely initiated from North America, or from US and Canada. There are other service agencies in other churches and they have things to share too. So the uh, Global Anabaptist Service Network is an opportunity to share. Uh, we are just at the verge of bringing into existence a Global Anabaptist Peace Network. So this summer in Amsterdam, we hope that network will be launched. The uh, educators, schools are a common, I mean, a, a essential to identity whether it's just basic literacy or whether it's theological training for growing churches. And educators in our global family have been in, ICOM has done amazing things, but that conversation needs to be extended. So an educator's network and also healthcare. So health organizations are now talking about. In none of these cases is Mennonite World Conference creating something we, we, we're not about building an empire or building programs, but it is a space within which the global family can nurture rhizomic connections. I am at the end of my hour, and I am going to, I'm going to just scrap the sermon part of the Earth is the Lord's, and I'm not going to say anything more about Mennonite World Conference because I really want to hear from you. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. I know it's kind of abrupt, but um, that's okay. I mean, you, I, you, won't, you aren't missing out on too much. Uh, I really would like to hear, what does this 
what does this spark in your imagination? Or where does it unsettle you? Um, what are the corrections you would like to, to offer? I sort of took you off guard there, sorry. So take a moment to, to think a little bit, but um, I'm eager to hear what's germinating in your, in your minds. Come to the mic, say your name maybe if you're able, or we're small, uh, I guess maybe for the, for the video you should use the mic. Hi, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Paul Dirksen. Uh, do you mind giving us a couple minutes on what would have been your sermon? <laughs> I was waiting all evening. Okay. Um, I'll try to do it in... Yeah, sure, yeah, I can, I can, I can do that. Um, but I shouldn't use notes because then I'll be tempted to get carried away with my own rhetoric, and so I'll just leave that. Um, it starts for me in April of 1525 when an Anabaptist named Elsie Baumgartner was arrested by authorities in Zurich and she was accused of the crime of rebaptism and she was given the choice of either life imprisonment or if she would agree to leave Switzerland and never to come back, if she would take an oath to do that. And um, they assumed that she would do the latter and she refused, she said, and she refused by quoting, it's there in the interrogation records, the earth is the Lord's, and said that she had as much right to live in this territory as the government authorities did. And it turns out that this simple verse from Psalm 24, verse one, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, becomes a motif in early Anabaptist writing. So it shows up in confessions of faith, it shows up often in interrogation records, it's woven into some hymns, we see it in letters. The earth is the Lord's. It, uh, there are some Im immigrant families in the, in the Swiss tradition sometimes have it as wall mottos. The earth is the Lord's. Um, what is it about that verse? Hans Landis, who was the last Anabaptist to be executed in 1614, a 72-year-old lay preacher, a stubborn farmer, gray-bearded, he has his head chopped off, and before he goes to the execution block, he turns to the executioner and he preaches a sermon in which he says, the earth is the Lord's. What's going on? Why is this verse so, so crucial? And for me, it's a reminder. In the first place, it's a statement about political sovereignty. Um, that is to say, Anabaptists have a high view of the state in its ordering function. We generally have said we should respect the state. Uh, we should pray for our authorities. We're, we're not uh, uh, tearing down good governance. But Throughout their history, they also have been very clear that the authority, the sovereignty of the state has its limits. And at a certain point, Anabaptists have consistently said to the government, the earth is the Lord's, and I will obey God rather than humans. And if my conscience, the convictions of my conscience, unsettle you so much that you must persecute us, then we are ready to pick up the pilgrim staff and become pilgrims and wanderers and go to some other place in the world. So we have generally carried our passports gratefully but somewhat lightly. My concern is that particularly in North America, particularly in the United States, that conviction is no longer at the heart of our identity. We have become very comfortable with the fact that we have CO status, and we are able to participate fully in the democratic processes, and in the court, course of that, we have sometimes, and again, I talk more to my people in the United States, I have friends on both the right and the left who are unable to sleep before elections because the sense is that the outcome of this election has ultimate consequences. And to those people, I want to say, no, the earth is the Lord's. You can, you can relax your grip on a political identity, not to say that we don't care about what's happening in the politics of our country, but your identity is not first and foremost 
pegged to the political outcome of wherever it is you're living. And in any case, your citizenship is not to be understood as bought with other person's blood in the sense that you should always still be ready, even though it seems like a stretch to many of us, you should still be ready to say, no, here you've gone too far and I will leave. I will let go of my comfort and security because the earth is the Lord's and no place on this earth will I be without a home. The second argument in the earth is the Lord's, it's a statement about economics. It's, an, it's a clear statement that everything that we have comes to us as a gift from God and that we are ultimately only stewards of that gift. One of the paradoxes of Mennonite history is that wherever Mennonites have gone, whether that was the steppe lands of South Russia or Penn's Woods in Pennsylvania or the wheat fields of Kansas or Manitoba or Alberta or the Paraguayan Chaco, wherever we have landed, as pilgrims and aliens and strangers, through hard work and large families and social capital and a confidence that God, we are about God's work, Mennonites have thrived. We have done well. And in those places where we have landed, the gift that was once given to us as immigrants has now slowly become a possession that we claim as a right because we worked hard for it and we earned it. The earth is the Lord's is a statement, is a confession that reminds us over and over again that everything we have is indeed a gift that is not ours. The Apostle Paul, this is one, this might sound strange to you, but it is one reason why I'm anxious about becoming a communion. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians describes the early church in pretty sharp language. And there he says, there are places among you where the rich come and they feast on sumptuous banquets, sumptuous tables, while the poor in your midst stand outside the door and are unfed. And Paul says that is wrong. And he goes beyond that. He says that's why some of you are sick and some of you have died. Read it, it's pretty strong language. And you are taking communion unworthily when there are those gaps in economic possessions in your midst. What would it mean as Mennonite World Conference if we call ourselves a communion? Are we ready to take seriously what the economic claims that are made on us when we come to the Lord's table? I hope so. Um, and in many ways we have we are doing that. So I, I, you know, I think of our relief sales, I think of the enormous generosity of the church in North America. I don't discount that at all, but we should be reminding ourselves that the earth is ultimately the Lord's. And finally, I think it is, it is a profound theological statement. The earth is the Lord's offers a window into why Anabaptists in the 16th century were able to go to their death sometimes singing as they are being executed. Why? Because they are certain that God has already won the victory, that the powers of evil will not prevail, and that this is not the end. The earth is the Lord's is a statement that the outcome of history has already been settled and that you have the freedom to live in that joyful confidence that you don't need to set the world straight. They were not naive about evil. The Anabaptists experienced firsthand the capacity of human beings to inflict evil on, on each other. But they knew that evil was not the last word, and that's because the earth is the Lord's. And I'll end this with a, a, a little story that brought this home for me in a really powerful way about 10 years ago. I was traveling in Costa Rica, in the, in the province of San Carlos, and I was not intending to go where the story led. I was there for other business related to Goshen College. 
But traveling on a mountain road in Costa Rica, I passed some women who were walking up this muddy road wearing devotional headdresses that looked vaguely familiar. And I, I, I remember seeing it and being a little unsettled by it. And then I continued on and I stumbled into this green manicured yard, a farmstead in the little village of Pital, uh, where the Penner family lived. And I knocked on the door and they welcomed me in and it turned out that the Penner family was part of a migration from Russia to Manitoba in 1874. The father had moved to Guatemoc, Mexico. He had met his wife in Belize and then as part of a mission initiative they had left Belize and they had landed in this tiny little town of Pital and there on his mantle I saw the faded photographs of the great grandparents from, from the Ukraine. And right next to the Penner family, I met um, the Yoders, who were part of a beachy Amish mission movement that in the late 1960s had moved from Virginia to Costa Rica, settled in the Arana region, and then had found their way to this town of village of Pital. And as I sat drinking coffee around their table, they told stories of their immigrant ancestors who came from the Palatinate to Pennsylvania and from Pennsylvania to um, Costa Rica. But the real power of the story <laughs> happened in the rest of the afternoon when I went from one little house to the next of local Costa Ricans who had received the good news of the gospel and were now engaged in a very energetic mission work in their local community so that there were eight little churches in the villages around that they had helped to plant. So here in this in this little greenhouse, two traditions born out of the same renewal movement in Zurich in the 16th century, had both traversed oceans and through very different routes had found their way to this little isolated region in Costa Rica, and yet the clear sense of the future of that movement was not in the hands of the Penners or the Yoder families, but in those Costa Rican leaders, the Lopez's and the Garcias, who were moving this message forward. And I worshiped with them on Sunday morning in a little clapboard church house where the men sat on one side and the women sat on another and they sang songs in a kind of four-part harmony accompanied by guitars in Spanish, gospel songs translated into Spanish. And on the wall of that church was a motto that said, El Señor es la tierra y su plenitud. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And it was clear to me that something in this little, little rhizomic moment, something of the vision from Revelation 7 was coming to pass. And that's worth bearing witness to. And my hope is in the, again, the multiplicity of those little moments where traditions find their way together and somehow, you know, they have all kinds of problems. I don't want to pretend that, that they have it figured out. They, they face, I've followed the group, they face leadership issues. It's, and yet there's still something powerful is unfolding there. So that oh, it was more than five or seven minutes, but that was a sermon uh, in uh, a briefer form. The earth is the Lord's.